welcome uh, to this sort of design lab seminar about how you might actually think about your research activities and develop some new strategies for semester two. Okay, so these are things I'm actually really personally really passionate about. And so I'm looking forward to having a conversation about first figuring out your brand, uh, so your sort of research brand, your personal research brand, and articulating what that is. And second, coming up with some strategies so that we work smarter, not harder. Um, so it's kind of, I'm hoping that we less than 90 minutes and it'll be pretty interactive in places. It's hard to try and do it in two places, but some people face to face and you guys online. So at the outset, let me pay my respects and acknowledge traditional owners of the land where I and QZ stand, the Turrbal and Yaga people, as the First Nations owners. Um, I pay respect to their laws, customs and creation spirits. I recognise these lands have always been places of teaching and research, and also that these lands have never been ceded. Um, I also acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QT community. So we're going to do five things today. Um, and the first is to clarify your identity as a researcher. Okay, so one of the reasons that we struggle as academics is that we're really, really busy all the time. And that's particularly true right now. The COVID-19 pandemic came out of nowhere. We've had to put our teaching online. And the plans that we might have had for semester one have kind of just gone away. Um, and so what we need to do is figure out how we can take that control and think about what we might do for semester two. Um, and at the same time, we need to realise that we've got to do all kinds of different things um, as academics. We've got to be teachers, we've got to be uh, researchers, we've got to look after students, we've got to be committees, we've got to be in meetings, and it can be like really overwhelming. Uh, and so Kathy Mazek, who's a woman's writing coach, uh, has put together this structure uh, that I really like, and she runs a free Facebook group, if you're interested. Um, she's put together this structure to talk about what she calls her academic mission statement. And the big idea here is that you try and clarify and articulate your mission. And if you're clear about that and you've got it aligned, then you can use this as a guide to determine what you do or don't do. Okay, so what I want you to do is take five minutes, with a bit of pen and paper, and if you've got the handout, use that. Take five minutes and think about, okay, who am I as a researcher? What do I want to do? Um, and being clear about your values. And the reason this is important is that if we can do this, then we can use this as a decision-making frame, okay? It will help us think about what we should and shouldn't do when opportunities come our way. So instead of blindly saying yes to everything, we could be much more strategic. Say, yeah, that's aligned to my personal brand or it's not aligned. Um, so Kathy uses this framework where you say, I use methodologies or theoretical frames to study populations, phenomena of context in order to be the change you want to see in the world, okay? Um, and the wonderful Heather McKinnon uh, here at QT did hers the other week, and I'm sharing it. Um, she gave it to me uh, with the proviso that, oh, I've gone, it's really, really messy and not very good. It's really great. Um, and you can see that she says, I use design methodologies to investigate everyday practices that contribute to environmental damage in order to support the development of, of creative, adaptable, and environmentally conscious communities. Okay, and she also brainstormed and drew up all kind of the concepts that she was thinking about. So I'm going to stop talking and ask that you have a go at writing your academic mission statement. So, now that you've got a sense of who you are as an academic, you should be able to use that to guide decisions, okay? That's the whole point of having an academic mission statement, is that you can use that so when opportunity comes up, you can say, oh, actually, no, it's not aligned to what I want to do, or yes, it is aligned. Um, and it will really help you, I think, uh, when it comes to going for promotion or selling and crafting your narrative, both internally and externally. Like, if we know um, if we start to build up this brand, we know, oh, person X, they always do research with children using co-design methods, or person Y, they're all about sustainability and more than humans' future. You've got a really strong brand that helps your identity. Um, but it can be actually really challenging to do, and you can change your brand over time as well. So this is something to help you think about what you might, where you want to take your career and what name you want to build for yourself. So now that you know a little bit more about what your academic mission is, uh, a reminder to pick your primary program within the lab um, and nominate yourself to that. 
So the rest of the presentation on slash workshop, I really want to focus on how we might create more time to do the one thing that's important to us, that is more time for our research, more time for our thinking, more time for all that exciting stuff that we're passionate about that drives us. This is a book that uh, Gary Keller and Jay Pickerton wrote called The One Thing, and it really is about when you focus on one thing, um, extraordinary things happen. And in this book, they, had, they share this wonderful Russian proverb, which is, if you're chasing two rabbits, you don't catch either one. It's a really, it's a really good point. Actually, if you think about it, if you're out there trying to chase two rabbits, let's not think about why you might be doing that. You can't catch either because you're too distracted and you're not focused. Whereas if you just focus on one rabbit and chasing that one rabbit or one idea or one goal, you're more likely to succeed. And so but in the whole book, it's actually a reasonably good book actually about the power of focusing on one thing. Okay. Um, and it's a really important reminder that we cannot and should not do everything. Um, and we need to be guided by our academic mission statement and our values to pick the one thing that we need to do. I really like it because it, it does really, it really helps me uh, to think, think about what I should focus on. And I actually have a very messy, dirty post-it reminder in my office that shows that I uh, asked, what's my one thing today, this week, this month, and this year? And I've just actually started in my diary to make a little note about the one thing I need to do today that's most important. But what I want us to do is take a moment to think about, okay, acknowledging that the last six months have been pretty crap, pretty difficult um, and, and difficult for everybody in different ways. Whether you've got young children and you had to homeschool um, or you've got family or just challenges in terms of work and teaching and just everything. Let's put that aside and say, okay, when it comes to the end of 2020, acknowledging that it's been a pandemic, what is the one thing in terms of my research that if I achieve that, I'll feel really happy and proud inside myself. I'll be like, yeah, I really kicked some butt in 2020. I really kicked some goals. Um, and, I, and it makes me feel that I've actually achieved something. Okay, so what's that domino? And it's really, it's important to try and think about the domino effect. So what is the big major one domino thing? If you knock that over, everything else this year and next year will be super easier. For those of you who are doing your PhD, no doubt it's completing your PhD. So for others, it might be different things. And you need to really put some thought into what that one thing is, and that's your non-negotiable priority for the rest of the year. Okay. Uh, Juan's going to have us drop into breakout rooms and talk about that, um, but I might try to just do it as a group. I'll just give you some ideas of what that one thing might be. It could be a key publication. Okay. So you might be like, I really want to secure a higher research allocation next year, and to do that strategically. I need a Q1 publication. I need, because you know, I get three points for that, you know, it's the way the workplace system works. So if I really focus them and do that, that's my focus. Or it might be, I really need research money. How can I do that? So my one thing might be figuring out the steps to, to doing that. Or it might be connecting with industry. I might be, I need to grow my HDR network. It's just the one thing that, you know, you know inside yourself, that if you achieve it, despite everything that's happened in 2020, You'll be super happy with yourself. So, does anyone want to pop up and say? So, I'm using Shelly's computer, so I'm just like atrocious at using. Oh, there we are. Uh, does anyone want to pop up and see what your one thing might be? It's all right, Shelly, I figured it out. Yeah. <laughs> does anyone share one thing? Or do we want to we want to break into breakout rooms? I'll go right there. I can go. Um, um, mine is that I've got the discovery project which uh, we got at the end of last year and then we had a whole load of legal contractual complications with the ARC and with our partner university RMIT that we've been fiddling around with and have delayed us plus all the COVID and teaching and everything I've had to do so I haven't done much at all on it and I really need to get it started officially it started as of the start of June so I actually need to get it actually going and recruit the students and recruit my research fellow and actually make it start happening and Okay, so you, it's this project. Yeah, because otherwise I can't, you know, we're not gonna get any results unless we actually start, so. Okay, yeah. so that's your, so maybe you need to write your little post or block out a day in your diary and look at some practical strategies for how you can build more time, do your one thing in a little bit. Do anyone else have got a one thing they wanna share with the group? I, I can share. 
uh, mine is very similar. <laughs> so the, my, my grant got announced, so now I really had to do it. Um, and so the one thing that I want to do is start connecting with, with the industry and hospitals so I can see um, uh, how, how can I do the research, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, does anyone want to, anyone else? And you can write it down in the worksheet if, if you don't want to talk about it out loud. But, you know, it's really important that you do actually write it down and think about it. Anyone else want to share their one thing? It can be more minor. Oh, hello. Yeah, great. Um, so I would like to um, finish my book proposal, get my book proposal accepted, and start to write the book. Um, so I've been, working, I've been working with Routledge on a book proposal that I was invited to do. So I just have to find the time to bang it out. I'm trying to bang out all these other articles and I, I just keep putting the book off. So yeah. the one thing that I want to accomplish this year. That's really good. So then that means that you need to prioritize that or you need to look at your year and say, I'm actually only, only going to be happy if that book proposal is under review. Do I, you know, and we are in June, basically July. So we've got six months to go. Um, and the good part is the second part of this is that we're going to talk about ways you can make more time, I hope. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I'll share mine. Can you hear me? We can. Go, Dantha. Um, well, I have a number of uh, papers that need to be finished. Um, so some are sort of half started and just need some attention. So um, I did an audit of my calendar <laughs> and trying to consolidate, um, you know, certain things on certain days. So I really need to build a writing routine into that. Calendar. Oh, that's really powerful, Brenda. Does anyone else got what, um, realize that we need to build a writing routine in? Anyone else want to talk about that realization? A writing routine. So whether that might be, yeah, I'm going to write every morning from 6 to 7, or I'm going to block out Friday afternoons, or I'm going to say no to meetings before midday because I know that uh, the morning from 9 to 12 is what Pippi Mazak picks about good tiger time. We're talking about this later, but you try to time is when you're the most productive you. So you see, you know, you might work for an hour, but the productivity is like 10 times that. You know, you know, sometimes you're really, you're really in the in the in, in the flow. Um, and with how Chicken Monkey Sticky So um who wrote this book um and spoke about flow and the power of being able to just be in the flow and getting things done. You can identify that within yourself and can you save that special magical time when you're actually picking butt, um, that is actually really powerful. And I know we don't have some of that much control over our diaries that we can try. Um, we can try to do that. Um, okay, anyone else want to jump in? Okay, so what I want you to do is just write down your one thing in your workbook, just take 30 seconds and say, you know what, 2020, it's been blooming hard. But the one thing that will, if I hit the end of 2020, the one thing that will make me feel that I've done well um, is this activity. So to achieve that activity though, we actually need to make more time in our day. Um, and we need to change things, okay? Because there's this really good saying, nothing changes, nothing changes. And it's super true. If you don't make a conscious choice to not to change something, to do something different, and experiment on something, you're going to have the exact same outcomes three months from now as you had from today. Like I, and I, I'm, I'm like that too. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. But it's not a point. Get a bit sick of the gunners. You know, the gunners get you because you're not going to do it because you want to, but you haven't for the last two years. Why would this year be any different? Um, so I think that most of you know my background's in psychology, so I love all this personal productivity stuff. So I'm going to give you the best tips um, from, and I do a lot of reading in this space, I'm going to give you the best tips that I know of, but then I definitely do want us to brainstorm and share some approaches that have worked for us, okay? Because if we're going to make time for our research, we're going to, we're going to make time, and we are going to, we're going to make time for our research this year, we need to change things, okay? Um, in fact, that pen, there's a photograph of a pen just on the screen. It says, text less, write more. And uh, Natalie Wright gave this to me uh, for supervising a PhD. And it's a really good reminder that we need to be conscious and intentional about the choices we make. And if we choose not to make time for our research, it's not going to happen. Okay? We always turn up to get our lectures. We never, it doesn't matter 
what's going on in their lives pretty much. We're always there Tuesday at 11 o'clock, Friday at 3 p.m. We rock up and we deliver the lecture no matter what. And we need we, our research um, and our own identity deserves the same respect and commitment. Okay, so it's really important that you build this into your diary uh, and you do it the same way. Who jump your hand up if you, if you years ago it was really popular this this uh, time use matrix? I hate it. I, I remember years ago, 15 years ago, I went to some workshop the whole day, and this is basically what they taught us. It's something important or urgent, not important, not urgent, and we'd figure out whether you did something. It, I really don't like that approach. Um, I don't think it's particularly helpful, but it is kind of the only approach that most of us know. Uh, and it is a little bit helpful if it's urgent and important, then get it done. But actually, the traditional to-do list is the wrong tool. Uh, we need to be really intentional about where and when we're going to do our research, okay? There's two examples here about that. So I want you to think about, okay, what's my semester two look like? I know I've got my teaching on these days. When and where am I going to do my, I'm going to, a good guy this time, am I going to do my research? And I want you to write that down on your page. Because if you commit to where and when, you're much more likely to do it. So there's two examples here from studies. One is about a uh, percentage of women who agreed to do a breast self exam in the next month. 100% of those who said where and when they would do it, did it. Only 50% of those who said, oh yeah, I'm going to do it, did it. And similarly, and I can't think of a more stressed out population than drug addicts. So drug addicts in withdrawal agreed to write an essay before 5 p.m. Uh, the next day. 80%, so the vast majority of those who said when and where they were going to do it, so after lunch or after I watched Golden the Beautiful, whatever, we came up with a where and a when, did it, versus none of those who didn't say where and when. And I think any of us who have been around the blocks a bit realise that we have a plan, a vague plan in our mind to do research, we just never find the time. It's not about finding the time, it's about actually locking the time in if, if, and treating it with the same non-negotiableness that we treat the teacher. Okay, so I want you just to write down really briefly on step three a little bit where and when you might do your research in semester two and block it out in your diary, okay? And don't move it unless it's a meeting with like Lisa or the dean or someone really important. Just And I'm happy for you to uh, write in there, oh, it's a meeting with Yvonne, meet with Yvonne or meet with Design Lab or something. Because sometimes if you've got a meeting in your diary, people are less likely to override it with just block out some time. Should we do it on the diary now? Yeah, do it in your diary now. Manuela says she said do it in your diary now. It's a really good idea. If you know when you're teaching and you've got even one day free or something, or you know your if you know your partner can drop children to school, if you've got kids, you could do the morning, um, whatever, block, block out what you think is a reasonable amount of time. So some people need at least three hours to do something, others can do little bits. Oh shoot! I've, and of course, we've got all the shuffle and write sessions. We've got three now. So Veronica's running one on Tuesdays with HDR students. I think it's in the early afternoon. Thea's got um, Wednesdays from 11.30 to 1. And on Friday, my, um, Manuela and Ed Cushion, I think, are running one, which is usually at this time. So even if you make a commitment to come to one of those, or put them all in your diary um, as some space time things. So just block out some time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to manage your day. Uh, this is a, actually a really good book by these guys. They used to work for either Google or Microsoft, and they're sort of designers by training, uh, John Knapp, uh, Jake Knapp and John Zariski. And they're talking about making time and thinking in a different way about how we manage our day. By the way, I actually quoted the document. they former Google executives. They talk about a highlight, and I quite like this. So that, uh, their argument is that work is a bit monotonous, um, and if we want to break that sort of procrastination and do things differently, we need to structure a day in a way whereby we have a highlight, okay? Tasks are too boring, they're too machine-like, goals are too far away, we can have a highlight. It's just right. And they argue there's three types of highlights, okay? So one is urgency, so the most pressing thing you have to do today. So a lot of us, there'd be grants that are due, we submit a promotion application, might be a grade, on a similar report to the urgency highlight, okay? Satisfaction is the second criteria. So you might have something that really satisfies you to do, okay? 
I mean, it gives you, you really, you, for a lot of us, I know it is for me, it's just a lot of crap that hangs over month after month that you just don't do because you don't get around to it. It's just continually there. So in some ways, ticking that off can give a lot of satisfaction. You think that reconceptualize in mind is a highlight that something cool that happened. And then joy, and I really like the joy. Most of us are atrocious, and I hope it's not just me, taking our lunch breaks. I get to know an academic who is very good at like walking in and taking your lunch breaks because we're just, yeah, we're just, we care about our work and we're really passionate. But we actually have to build in some joy into our day. So a highlight might be once a week, you lock in a yoga class and go to it or you make the time to bike to work or do something fun. But they're saying you need to plan your day around a highlight and consciously observe it. I love Karen Ware, I think it was a previous job I learned this, the box yourself in strategy. It's not actually about boxing. It's about boxing yourself into a corner whereby you've got no choice but to do that activity. So you, any of us who are parents know that if you're doing a pickup or a drop off, you have no freaking choice. You must leave here exactly at 2.30 to get to school by three to pick them up. So that's boxing, boxing yourself into an activity that you must be at. But you can do the same with your research goals. So you can box yourself into an activity which might be yeah, a book proposal deadline, or I will often do a search for a call for papers. I usually search every six months or so, just generally Google call for papers in my research area in the year, find a call for papers that's vaguely aligned to what I do. Um, and it might have a, a due date of like July 20th. And I'm like, right, that's my deadline. And I, I box myself in and I do it. Okay, so it's an external deadline. This is why a lot of us, we just, it's such as always the last thing because it's just a nice to do, not a priority. You need to reframe how you engage with it. You can box yourself in with a deadline, I think is really great. Um, and even start and right, you can argue that's boxing yourself in, right? Because it's a it's in your diary. People expect you to turn up, they will give you a high five if you're there. You box yourself in, you're honoring yourself. Um, and people do that if you, if you belong to a gym or something that's in you're paying money, you're boxing yourself into going because you're paid for it. So it's just a way to think rethink things. Uh, so in the book, Make Time, and they have a free downloadable thing that you can print off where you can write, okay, what's today's highlight? Did I make time for it? And circle yes, no. They've got a lot more concepts in your book. I'm not going to go through it uh, because I just, yeah, I'm not going to. But you can evaluate where you, was your focus today laser-like? Were you energized? You know, what did you try today? How did it go? So it's really using, you know, we think of Sean's reflective practice is where you reflect on professional activity and you develop over time. It's using that but focus on your work. Okay, in a way that, I mean, as academics, the great joy of our job, I think, is the freedom and the flexibility in that we get to decide what we do and when we do it and how we do it. So if you're a night owl, you can stay up late and do things. But the downside is that we get to decide when we do it, what we do and how we do it. And so we can either overwork and be overwhelmed and not particularly productive because we just get ourselves into a block and I've been there and done that. Or we can actually just take that some control, put some boundaries in and some discipline and actually get, I hope, more joy out of our work. Um, and we can, we can think about and manage time really differently too. So I haven't done, I'm going to talk about two different things too. Okay, so we're still on step three. If you're doing the handout, we're about creating time for research and remembering that if nothing changes, nothing changes. So we can do a standard that I have a time order with a typical work week and identify where and, and when you'll make time for your research dreams. And it might be those sharp and right sessions or it might be some other time. But then you need to think about how you're going to respond differently to the challenges that come through. Okay, so if you've got a piece of paper, blank piece of paper, now's the time to get it out. I'm going to do, I prefer the earth of the zone, but we'll do the burner first. So you might like that. Okay, so this is from Nathan Kurtz there again. And they're talking, this, their analogy is this is the kitchen, okay, and this is the cooker, the stove top. And it's the burner, okay? And you can only have so much. You're cooking, you're cooking, you know, you cook a few things at once. You know, you've got the steak going if you're not a vegetarian, and you can, you can only do a little bit at a time. And the argument is you can only you can only be one most important project at a time, and we need to be clear about that. So get your bit of paper and a pen and try and write 
a top left front burner, and this is your current top priority project, which we should have identified before for your one thing for the year. So it might be if you're Janice, it's writing a book proposal. If it's if you're Thea, it's kicking off her ASC discovery project, Australian Research Council discovery project. So that's your front burner. On the back burner is your second most important project. Okay, so and I like I like Matt's book because the most important project is writing a book. So it is to do with writing which is a lot of us. So the left hand side should be up the front as your front burner. Underneath is a counter space, okay? That's just the ideas associated with your front burner project, okay? And you've got the back burner, your second most important project, and you've got the kitchen sink, everything else that goes in there. So it really just is a way to conceptualize in your own mind all the crap that you have going on. And you might have a lot of crap going on, which we all do. And if we've got to let some of that go through the keeper, I think that's the same. It's going to pull, I'm going to be silent for a bit while you try and write that out a little bit. And just be clear in your own head what choices you are making and what your priorities are. So top left is your front burner. That's your most important project. Underneath that is a counter space, any kind of additional stuff that comes up. Top right is the back burner, your second most important project, and you've got the kitchen sink, which is everything else underneath. Okay. So that's one way that you can conceptualize what the heck you've got going on and what's most important. And if you've got too much on there, then you do need to actually sit down with somebody and talk about strategically what is the most important. Um, now, this is my favorite approach. It's critical now. Uh, so this guy, Martin Lindberger, and his, his book is available for free. It's like an ebook you can download. And if you text it, Sammy, you can actually integrate it into your email as well. And it, does some magical things. I managed to make that align for a while and then it fell apart. But so Martin's come up with this thing called, he calls it the life-changing ma magic of urgency zones or the one minute to do list. And I do, I do like this one minute to do list. It's, for me, it's been really helpful. So he's got three zones about how you conceptualize stuff. So the first zone is critical now, okay? And that is the stuff that you must absolutely get done today, no matter what. And by that, by the no matter what it is, you would stay back at work tonight to midnight to get it done. So there's probably only a handful of things that should be in your critical now uh, activity list. It should only take you 20 seconds to write that list, it's two or three tasks, it's the critical now. So for most of us, it's things like grades, we've got ASC discovery rejoiners due, that's that. It's the things you must do no matter what. Then he has a his zone, zone two is called opportunity now. And this is tasks that need to be done within the next two weeks or so, so things that you're thinking about in your head. And you can just, you can create in his little book, which is free to download and use, he outlines how you can integrate this into your email system. And if someone is super tech savvy, figure out how to do it and help me do it again, that'd be great. Uh, it talks about opportunity now, so things that need to be done within the next two weeks or so. And then you've got over the horizon. And I really love over the horizon. That's just stuff that's not particularly important, you're vague and you're aware of, it'd be nice to do, Taking up mental space in your head, you can just bang it there. I've created a Trello board uh, for my over the horizon things. Like, so it's all my ideas of things I'd like to do one day. And you know, I've got a lot of ideas in there. It's very, very messy. Uh, but I, this has really helped me figure out what the heck I need to do every day and make sure that crap gets done. Okay, so critical now, yep, must be done no matter what. Opportunity now, you've got a list of things you just and you cross them off as you go, as you get opportunity do it. It sounds really simple, but it is, it, it is actually, I find it really uh, positively life-changing. So what a challenge I would like you to do is sort of experiment with either the burner uh, or the, the urgency zones, or we talked about the highlights or your own system to try and get control back into your workday. I think most of us, I know I do, we just kind of 
float along or respond to emails and we need to think much more strategically about how we plan our work day and how we, we make time for research. So I do want us to do a little bit of conversation. So this is open to everybody to have a bit of a chat for a few minutes about any, I've talked about a couple of strategies that might be of interest. I'm just wondering if anyone else wants to share some. I'll talk through a couple here. So I alluded before, uh, Kathy Marvak talks about tiger time, your most productive time. You shouldn't waste that time. So I'm trying to do this thing where I have no meetings before midday. Okay, so most people, the mornings are their most productive time, but don't waste that valuable time for meetings. <laughs> like save that for you and your research. I talked about seeking out artificial deadlines, so call for papers, blocking out some time to do research. I'm all about accountability, reward and punishment in terms of rewarding yourself. So most of you have heard me talk about this before. You know, so reward yourself when you do, when you submit an article, when you do something, but also like punish yourself. So it's always embarrassing when I share this, but I won't let myself go to the toilet uh, until I've finished the thing I'm working on. So I won't let myself go, like I'm writing a paragraph or a page, I will not let myself go to the bathroom until I've finished. So my reward for finishing that page is toilet time. <laughs> and I started that when I was a PhD student because I was really poor and I couldn't afford coffee. But you know, and sometimes you can't afford those nice rewards of being a nurse and for females. Uh, but everybody has got bodily functions that they can control, hopefully. Uh, and so you can reward yourself by going to the toilet. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a good reward. Um, it is a good reward. I mean, anyway, I'm not going to stop stop talking along. Uh, and you implement some kind of rules that are designed to help you. I try very hard to only supervise PhD students who are doing thesis by publication. There's a lot of work up front, but it usually pays off. And I'm trying a new way to limit, uh, to have meetings that only go for 30 minutes and to turn off the camera so that I can, I'm, I'm Zoom, so I'm preserving just my own sanity uh, and my own mental health because there's only so many Zoom meetings you can go to. Uh, I've been trying to put them on my phone and go for a walk and stuff that actually Sometimes works, often doesn't. I was in Kmart actually, I did a 5 a 4 30 meeting in Kmart. Really hard to concentrate when you've got all those bargains in front of you at Kmart. <laughs> <laughs> so just think hard about how you might do that. So, do we want to just brainstorm for a few minutes? Any of the ideas? Yeah, do you want to do them breakout rooms? Shelly's going to put us in breakout rooms for about maybe five or ten minutes. Because I'll... Okay, are we all back? Who wants to go first? Just jump in. But unmute yourself. Unmute yourself and jump in. Well, I, I can I can go first with our group. Go. Uh, so I was with Jeremy, Greg, and Mirko, and uh, we discussed a little bit what, what we tried to do to uh, take some control of our research time. Uh, we all seem to agree that the morning uh, seems to be the best time to to do research or reading. Uh, so, for example, I, I usually have a couple of days that I work from five to seven in the morning, which I know. Nobody else bothers me. Um, and um, some yeah. others try to organize, uh, you know, block some days where they have uh, a few things going on. So, so the Merkel was talking about his PhD day where he meets all the PhD students all in one day. So then he can have free time for other things. Um, what else? Uh, if people have uh, strategies to to deal with emails. So sometimes they, they, they block certain times to, to deal uh, with the emails or have strategies to kind of screen through emails uh, and uh, not um, spend so much time on that. Uh, Greg was saying that uh, in terms of uh, giving himself some rewards after having, you know, he organized his week. Uh, he's well organized. <laughs> um, he has um, a goals to meet every day, every week, and he meets them. Uh, by Friday, he opens a bottle of wine and celebrates. Um, <laughs> um, what else? Um, yeah, and, th and then the, the idea of blocking time uh, to do things. So uh, some I, I use the uh, shut up and write time and uh, my team in my group, they also kind of block some time to to do research with, with some other meeting. They block it as meeting and they have it to do research. So I think uh, Jeremy and Mirko and Greg, if you have anything else to add, is that? Yeah, Monday, Monday mornings. You Monday morning. 
yeah. Uh, so we say no. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we don't uh, work during the weekend, and then we try to have the mon Monday mornings free to uh, actually organize your week. So not start the Monday morning with a meeting right away. Yeah, agreed. Somebody else jump in. Just jump in. Can I just add uh, the the email thing? <laughs> so when we would do email corresponds to make it more efficient, to be really short and concise, rather than writing long emails because that takes so much of our energy up. And, um, you know, the, if most of the communication issue can be sorted even in a short, concise three-liner. And if there's more required, then this is just the minimum percentage usually. And then you can take it to a different means of conversation. But uh, that helps you to be very efficient with the, the processing a lot of emails. Greg, I think you and I might be twins. Because I don't know if you notice my email signature, but I've got this five-line email policy uh, where I try very hard to have all emails. And there's a movement called five-sentence email. You can Google it. Send a three sentence email, just bang it on your email. We can try and make a pledge uh, to do that. Okay, someone else? Good. Are we on Zoom actually? You guys aren't Zooming? Oh, do you want to talk to you here? Yeah. yeah. Right. In a, I, I can add what um, we, we talked about um, some strategies similar to Mirko. I do a uh, blocking out PhD day, but um, Fatima was sh sharing with us her Miro um, board that she uses to um, do the similar kind of uh, back burner, uh, front burner thing, but also she's got her to-do list and all sorts of uh, great things in her mirror board. And Anna was sharing with us her bullet journal. Um, so just different sort of strategies that, um, you know, we, we use to track the work that we're doing and, um, and help us like get through things. Um, yeah. Well, we remind me, I had a bullet journal at the start of the year and I've, I've, I've fallen away from doing it. Yeah, that's great. Are there any digital versions of a bullet journal? Does anybody know? What's a bullet journal exactly? I was even in Glenda's group and I somehow missed that. Just a journal of bullet no, points? Uh, uh, Manuela's going to talk more. Yeah, Manuela's just going to like that. That's like bullet points. Yeah, it's sort of similar, but you you, do, you, a, 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 a you can Google it, and you you keep the you keep the first pages of your of your diary blank, come to table of contents, and you number each page. You've never had it. Well, you, and then you can write on page four. You write what you know. I was at a meeting at Arm Hub or whatever, and so you could actually reference yeah. things. Does that does that make sense? You keep the front pages, but, but it's page. also like this six. So it has the six month planning. So this I I just wrote the principles and I do it myself. So you do your six month planning, and then monthly, you do your daily, you have your list of the month, days of the month here, and then your to-do list for the month, which you come, you copy from your six month thing. But if you go to the website, they have all the rules there. There's a whole I've just, I've just gone there. to the website, so I'll... Daily you do the stuff, and there's a rule, there's rules on the bullets mm -hmm. on how to to use the bullets and then and the thing is that whatever you don't accomplish on that day you just put an arrow and then you put, put report what i found really helpful is the six month plan because every month i go back to my monthly list and then i go back to the six month and see what's what's actually flowing or not so uh, you buy do you have to buy the special journal or you just no, use any no i just use i just use a blank, a blank journal you can buy this the journal. They have they, they have it for sale, but I don't like the rigidity of it. I am. I will jump in as well because I do the same. I buy my own. I just buy a journal and I make it myself. So there's my month. Can you see that the monthly? Yeah. And then this is a week version. So, but I actually find that the process of having to draw it out once a month is how I do the planning. So I actually find that really valuable, but yeah, yeah sure. being forced to draw it is part of the process of thinking. Okay, because I've got like two pages left in this notebook, so it's a good opportunity to, um, yeah, literally, actually one one blank page, so I can um, I can do that. Start first of July, next week. Start it. That's okay. So actually, while Manuel is here, I'm going to get her to talk about our group, our group conversations, or well, someone else can. I don't know. Uh, 
What did we talk about? You had your, uh, your physical wall with personality. Oh yeah, we started talking about how we do the horizon thing. Over, and, over the horizon. Over the horizon thing. And then um, we were like sharing how we do it in different ways. And um, because most of us here are in the IVD um, visual area, we all had, you know, like visual strategies to dealing with it. Anastasia has a sort of a board, like a, like a visual board where she collects all the, you know, like images and um, and notes and things that she finds around this like sort of horizon idea and then eventually it comes back into reality and I have uh, I have posted notes on um, in front of my just behind my computer as well with every every idea that I have for a project or for a paper I just stick it on a post-it note and then if I get to do it and when I get to do it I just stick a big a red tick and then it keeps me um, gives me a sense of achievement as well. What else did you talk about? So about blocking out time for meeting, yeah. with, oh, yeah. meeting, with, me. Yeah. meeting with me and blocking out time for meetings. Uh, and I found, I've been trying to do this all year. And I found, so um, Leo's booking a meeting with me and he's a meeting with me. I think Jared, that's how Jared does it. Uh, Marcus, someone. Uh, so some people does it, I do it. But I found that if I put writing on my calendar, people still put, um, you know, like meetings on top of my writing time. So I'm, I'm creating um, uh, an imaginary- Project. An ima yeah, an imaginary project and an imaginary like- um, Collaborator. Partner, research partner. So I have meeting with such and such who doesn't really exist because it's my imaginary partner. So that people don't- Don't- Normal people don't tell anyone that. Normal no, people will say that you're crazy. <laughs> Something that was really helping me, but it's over with um, COVID was the writing Fridays at the State Library. So I just, they do shut up and write from 10 to 4 p.m. And it's in the, in the State Library level two. You have to book and you go there and there's people from everywhere writing different things, you know, like writing novels and writing memoirs and writing movies. And it's awesome to be there and talk to all these people. So there was the element of blocking my time and being in a different environment, but also the element of joy uh, of being somewhere with people who were also writing and trying to block their time for writing, but doing something completely different from what we are use, usually doing. And they, all, they often think, thought it was funny they was writing scientific papers. Very boring. But yeah, but uh, not that they were that scientific, but yeah, boring academic stuff. So, and, and it was a lot of fun and it was great to meet people. So I think embedding that joy, and it felt like a reward for the week too. So after the whole week, we had this, I, I was able to have this whole day, which was still super productive in terms of QT work, but I was in a different environment and you know, like engaging with these other kind of conditions. So I think awesome. that's it. That's good. And we were just saying that for Shut Up and Write, we'll give you guys to come here to the Zurich Cabin Grove. See, it's a really nice little set up. Uh, Marcus and I are going to write about this in the next newsletter. But there's no reason why you can't just bring your laptop and just work here if you want to see people socially distance. Um, there was also, you want to say, there was one, this one idea of Shut Up and Shut Up and Write. So actually, so we, Jared talked about Shut Up in May, but I think. The, you know, Manu was talking about research print. Well, I think what Pete is uh, suggesting here, carrying up with somebody is quite similar in the sense that it could be shut up and it's just, you know, work on a project or do something that's together other than writing. So, yeah. No, that's really good. You don't, when I, I was thinking that when you were just talking and I thought, you know, it's a way to book someone else in your diary. <laughs> and you just say, okay, I'm going to be your research buddy and we're both going to do research on the next day for so many hours. And you might just touch base at the start and the end, just send a text or a quick phone call or something, say, hi, I'm working on this and that, and that's it. You don't necessarily have to be working on the same project, but it just that's helps that's you. That's exactly what, what Leo was saying, because we can't match them right at those times next, next semester, but 
we're saying, well, he doesn't have it. You can make one up, either an imaginary one or find one one buddy, one person. Yeah. Okay. So you can um, have like Manuhara, imaginary buddy, but you can I love have a, buddy, a bit more, a bit more accountability if you have a real buddy. Maybe that might work oh, better for some people. Or you can pick a really good author that you oh. read and say, meeting with <laughs> meeting with Brene Brown, Brown. 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 meeting with yeah, yeah. yeah. meeting with one of those chief scientists of Australia or something. <laughs> Okay, other groups got some more chit chat and sharing of ideas, and it's really good to know how other people do stuff. I'm going to talk a little bit about personal Kanban because yep. I like to do lots of things at the same time. And with Kanban, um, in the School of IT, uh, com using Kanban board is a common thing for IT project. And there's another version of that which is called personal Kanban which means that at the same time, you can't work on more than four projects. And I really find it helpful and I can share my screen. Okay. Uh, I said in, in my group that I've been, uh, I've been using this style of uh, Bernal List uh, for, for Jake now for a year, more than a year, and I find it helpful. And because I'm a visual person, I, I found that uh, using Miro, because I can drag and drop image, video, or link to a website, anything, I will do that. And for personal Kanban, you can have different things and you can, uh, for each day, yeah, you can have a plan, whether that thing, that task is urgent or important or needed. Uh -huh. I mean, I mean, say which one is your priority and yeah, that's, that's my version of, yeah, I, I, I use combination of personal Kanban. Yeah. Uh, and and list. Yeah. That's cool. Does anyone else want to jump through with any ideas, either that you shared or didn't share? That one? Okay. So I'm glad about how to talk about this next bit, because it's a little bit, so we might raise some things that you feel uncomfortable about, so just skip it. Um, but we do need to become more resilient as an academic. And one of the things that I've really, reserved, really observed, and I've been an academic since 2004, I started at QUT, so like 15 or 16 years, a surprisingly long time. I've been in three faculties, like in three different campuses, actually. I started at Castle campus a long time ago. And my background is psychology, not design. So you have this plan, and then you have reality. And so we need to, the most successful academics are those who are able to survive the peaks and the lows. And to do that, you actually do have to be purposeful uh, and focused, because unfortunately, I wish this was true. I wish that we all looked out for each other and someone was looking out for you. That's not really how it works. You've got to look out for yourself. You've got the captain of your own ship, and you need to re uh, look after yourself. And the more resilient you are and the more you focus on self-care and things like that, the more likely it is that you are to succeed. Okay, you're, you know, uh, I love this little image about how you don't let your iPhone drive, you know, run on empty. You don't let yourself run on empty either. Okay, it's not a luxury to look after yourself. It's actually a necessity. We all know that we're smarter and we're faster and we're fresher and we're more creative and we're more productive and we're just more alive when we're full of energy, you know. And so we need to figure out what the heck keeps us charged and alive. And it might be. Despite all this tough times of COVID-19, for a lot of people I know, it's made them think about, oh, how do I live my life? And, oh, I might have thought I was an extrovert through and having an introvert who's really like being at home. Or it might be the opposite. You might be, oh, actually, I thought I hated going to office. That was me. But actually, I've missed going into office and missed seeing people. So we just need to be really clear about who we are and what sustains us and building that into our lives. So we have, as academics, we can control. We don't have a nine-to-five job. But that means that we can block some time out. You know, I started scootering with my kids in the afternoon. It's been really fun, but I hadn't done that before COVID because I was always at freaking work. So we can build those things even one afternoon a week. And I remember reading this years ago. I can't remember the source. Uh, it was about, um, I was a marketing and research consultancy. So one of those big consultancy came from G kind of, you know, those, those consultancy groups. And they were saying that people would come and they'd say, that's it, oh, I'm, I'm here, I've I'm, I'm done, I'm quitting, shove you and your job, it's too stressful, it's too hard, and, and the narrative doesn't sound quite, quite familiar, right? But then uh, the executive that they were talking to would look them up and they'd be like, hey, 
I hear you. I hear that you know that but life's difficult. But when I look at you, I see that you you haven't taken any leave. You got fifty days of leave in your in your accounts. You know, like I wish you put your hand up. You know, earlier and not come in to quit. You actually need to take some responsibility to take some leave. Okay, so a lot of us, not necessarily new staff. I know you're building leave up, but a lot of us been around for a while. We often have a lot of leave, and we the world's not gonna it's not gonna fall apart if we take some leave. So I'm taking the next two weeks off. I'm like, stuff it. I'm going to do the bit, bit for the Queensland economy and have a holiday and spend some money. Uh, and we need to do the same thing too. Okay, it's really important. I know that's a lecture. I know you probably believe it and are doing it. But I see too many people who are too upset and too just really on the edge of overwhelm and burnout. And we're the only ones who can save that. So I am going to talk a little bit about some of the things we can do to change our mindset. Uh, we all know, you know growth mindset and all that kind of thing, but and I'm the worst at this. I'm trying very hard this year to focus on the things that are inside my boat. That is the things that I can control and influence versus the things that I can't. And accepting, just being much better about accepting those differences. So this is my book. Book's not particularly great, so do not go get it. I, you know, um, uh, so I don't get the book. But the example was good. So this guy, when I interviewed all these Olympic rowers about Know, how they were going uh, and the conditions and, and it, it, was, it must have been like really bad uh, weather and it was like oh how are you going to cope with the rain or the winds or breaking an oar and each time they're like that's outside my boat and they realized that what what what, what they were saying was that I can't control those things I can't control the rain or the wind or whether my oar break, breaks but what I can control is me inside my ba- my boat and only everything else is just outside my outside my bandwidth and I think that's a really good reminder that we need to focus on what we can control. I can't, we can't control what's going to happen next semester or next year or how many students enroll or, or what their learning experience is like, but we can control how we turn up and, how, and, and those things. And we can control what we talk about and what we think about. And so just that kind of, you say, that, and I really only just come to this realization, you save an awful lot of mental energy and angst if you don't worry about those little things. Let someone else worry about it. Right, <laughs> so true. I wish I'd learned this a little bit earlier in my career, and I'm still trying really hard to even smack me around the hand or the face if I do actually start with you know drifting to those things where I'm thinking about things I have no control over. I have control whether over the next six months I sit down and, and write that book chapter that I'm supposed to write. You know, I could whinge and moan about a lot of things, and I sometimes do. Sorry, but um. I really have to focus on what's within my power to control and whatever else will happen, but I now have got confidence that we'll weather that. Uh, now, I really like this. Um, we all know that fable, the tortoise and the hare, and, you know, and, and, and the traditional meaning of this fable is that the tortoise wins because it just kind of kept on going and perseverance beats speed. And that's true, but actually what's also true is that the hare or the rabbit, if you think about the rabbit at the start of the presentation, we talked about how you can't chase you chase two rabbits, you don't catch either one, so you've got to focus on one. In this case, the rabbit should have won, okay? Like it's heaps faster. A tortoise by biology is just slow and useless. Like I had a pet tortoise when I was little. Let's not talk about him, actually. Let's move on. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, we're already, his name was, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I had a pet tortoise, he was quite stupid and quite slow, and he always got lost. And any, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about him. Um, so I want to talk about the hair, okay? The hair should have run. Should have won, had all the advantages, but the reason it didn't win, and it got freaking distracted. It like just ran off and chased every path and went over the place. And so yeah, it, this moral is that perseverance beats speed, but this, you know, which is why the tortoise won. But the other moral is don't get distracted. Keep your eye on the prize. Okay. Uh, there were some people I was talking the other day about about this that were often attracted by the shiny new project. And not even, you know, like, oh, that sounds freaking cool. You know, I want to be involved in this project to create that. That sounds really great. And so we run off and chase the shiny new thing and we forget to do the hard yards on the harder stuff. So we're kind of distracted and we're, you know, we chase that sort of shiny new thing. And it's really, we've got to do the hard yards on the hard existing projects, which might be, yeah, getting those publications out of your PhD. You know, working with your HDR student to do a publication with them rather than starting one of a trillion new projects. We have to honor our, honor our existing commitments. And I've sort of really refrained that a lot lately when I'm turning down opportunities. I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds so great. But 
put out my status for at the moment. I've got to honor my existing commitment. I've got these projects, I can't do it. But here, yeah, this person might be someone who's worth doing, or someone you know, reaching out to. So I think all of this can be like the here's the rabbit, you can be really fast and speedy, but only if we're not distracted. And yeah. We need to also uh, phone a friend. So it's like well, being hard with COVID, like we just developed a different note for that. Uh, so I just like in the handout, I made up a little survey and I put a little asterisk there. And let me read this out so I can full disclaimer. This is not a real assessment, it's just a fun tool quickly created from existing items online to provide a sense of areas you might want to focus on. It's not clinical advice, seek help from a trained professional. And when I say I made it online, like literally, when I was doing this actually was it yesterday morning, I think sometime I just googled some surveys on resilience. Okay, so I want you just to, there's two parts, you circle each one. Yes, not really, no. So I'll read them. A strategy in place for dealing with stress. Yes, not really, or no. I find it easy to ask my colleagues for help. Yes, not really, or no. I'm usually opt optimistic. I see difficulties as temporary and expect to overcome them. Question four, in a crisis or chaotic situation, I calm myself and focus on taking useful actions. And the last question in there is, I'm very durable. I hold up well during tough times. It's pretty obvious. If you stuck with more yeses there, then you're, you know, you're feeling kind of resilient. Uh, and if you stuck with more not reallys or no's, then you might need to think about some strategies to put in place to help you. Let's do the second part. I worry about issues I have no control over. Yes, not really, no. Failures are hard to forget and successes are hard to remember. Yes, not really, or no. I often feel anxious or angry that things aren't fair and I'm not in control. And the last question, I often find it pretty difficult to accept change and to move on. Okay, so again, with the second part though, the more often you say yes down there, it's kind of suggesting that you might want to do a little bit of work on yourself. Again, disclaimer, my PhD is in psychology, but I'm not a clinical psychologist. And what, if you need help, and I've used them before, you can use the QT Assure program. Okay, you get four free, you get four free sessions a financial year. So quick, get in now, you get like four before the of June, and you can get, you know, four in the next lot. It depends on who you get, but they can be quite helpful to talk through stuff, and they, they are there to help with work-life stress. You know, and if you're having challenges interacting with people, or you've got some challenging colleagues or students, and you know they're putting all their stress on you, they can help you come up with some strategies to um, to deal with that. And if it, actually, I read this great book about how to deal with uh, people who are, want to ruin your life and have high conflict personalities. I'm happy to do a session about how to manage people, how to work, you know, and how to sort of deal with yourself and interact better, because I'm trying to do that myself. If anyone's interested, drop me a message, okay, and do another session all about sort of being better interpersonally and not taking on others. I don't want to use, I'll just use the word others crap, okay? So it's not easy, okay, to develop a stress resistant approach to work in life, but it can be done. We can take some conscious steps to do that. You can get free counseling for QT Assure. You can do a wellness workshop. There's a ton of those online. Or you can read some books and implement new strategies. We could start a book club if there's interest on this. This is kind of stuff I do for a hobby in my own life because I'm like total loser. So I've got lots of suggestions. Um, but I'd like you just on this bit of page to think about what is one thing that you could do to try and build your resilience, okay? It might be a simple thing. But I'm going to give you three examples to inspire you and then maybe we can have a quick chat uh, if we want, as a group, about some things that we do that have helped us become more resilient or, or you know, just be more, because it's a, we've got really stressful jobs, you know, like really stressful jobs. Uh, so it's really important we reach out, we phone a friend, that we support each other. And I think that's really, in my mind anyway, it's a critical time of the designer and our school designer, but a great head of school bringing us together, uh, but we have to support each other. So I'm going to give you some examples to inspire you. <laughs> in the car, this is my six-year-old, my six-year-old ex-boyfriend strategy for anxiety. So my six-year-old Samantha, uh, she's had a bit of anxiety about school for a while now, but particularly during COVID, she didn't want to go back to school. She didn't, actually didn't, wouldn't, didn't leave the house for six weeks during COVID, and she didn't want to leave the house or go back to school until, quote, 
COVID was cured from the world. So you can imagine that we've got a few problems there. <laughs> so we've been watching some videos online, actually, that, um, uh, Natasha Daniels, I think, has three videos about setting anxiety in kids, and it's quite helpful. And so Natasha talks about turning down the volume in your head and, turn, and choosing what you tune into. So kind of speaking back to anxiety and turning it down, changing the channel, as if you were changing the TV channel. But in the car the other day, Samantha, on the way to school, Samantha said to me, I guess she didn't have any anxiety anymore. And I quote her, because she broke up with anxiety. She's like, anxiety is my ex-boyfriend. I don't talk to it. I don't speak to it. I got nothing to do with it. It's my ex-boyfriend. I'm like, that sounds like a good strategy. But where did you get that from? Like, it's actually quite smart. I like it. Because you think it when you break up with someone, it's true. You don't see them. You don't think about them. You cut them out of your life. She's like, yeah, I don't have anxiety anymore. Cut, you know, it's my ex-boyfriend. I really... I really like that and I should write a book about it because it's really funny. Um, so that's a good example. And, you know, <laughs> the second one is I did my degree at the University of Otago in New Zealand and I was really lucky to be under Professor Harlan Payne in my last year and she's now the Vice Chancellor of um, Otago and she's amazing and talented. But the number one thing I remember from her is that she, in her lab, they would print their peer review uh, Journal article like so the feedback they got from our reviewers they would print them and put them on the on the door so I, I, I put, yeah and pin them yeah and pin them to the notice board so everybody could see it so take this thing out of it by sharing it okay so they actually print it up and put it on the notice board uh, which is a really interesting example of a good way to share the take this thing out of that you know reviewer B or reviewer second reviewer. And then, obviously, anyone who knows me knows I'm a bit of a chatter. And also, sometimes I just can't let things fly by in meetings. I'm like, oh, that's not quite right. So I've got the strategy uh, uh, where I physically will sit on my hands and not talk. As a reminder, keep your opinions to yourself and just let it fly on by. So I'll physically sit on my hands as a thing to remind myself that I'm actually only allowed to comment. I only let myself comment once or twice, actually, I do try to mitigate that and I'll sit, physically sit on my hands and I've built in a few a number number of work life strategies too but I'm wondering if anyone wants to just share any kind of strategy that they've, they've experimented with to help them be more resilient and it could be in any sense any part of your life. Anyone got a, a strategy? I, I sometimes write an email and not send it. Yeah. Right. I sleep on it and then yeah or not yeah yeah nothing like the nasty email that you don't send love it anyone else i do this thing where i write a letter to my future self if i have a big um thing coming up whether it's promotion or a big book review or arc review i write a letter to myself and tell myself how to react if it's a negative news then tell myself how to react if it's positive news and then i fold up and seal the envelope and put them on the shelves and put it away and put the stress and worry away until that day comes where i find out the news and then i choose which envelope to open that's awesome, Janice. A letter to future you. That's yeah. so good. Um, along those lines, uh, a friend of mine told me this strategy, and I do quite like it. Uh, you lock things up in your, in, in your head in a filing cabinet. So you imagine your mind is a filing cabinet and you have a file in there. Each one might be, might, one might be entitled workship, family crap, and, and you allow yourself five or 10 or 15 minutes a day to, to do it. And you go to your mind and you're like, okay, I've got my 10 minutes of worry time. You open it up, you pull out the folder and you let yourself think and worry about it. And at the end of the 10 minutes though, put the folder back in mentally in the folder. You close it and you lock the door and you put the key um, on the shelf again. And I quite like that. And Marcus Goff actually told me a similar one. When he walks across the bridge, he just throws all his worries into the river and just lets the river, you know, wash them away. But we have to do those kind of things, I, I, I think, and talk about the, those kind of things that we do because we're in our jobs, not only with each other, with our students, we're dealing with a lot of mental health oriented issues and we think about our own mental health. You know, I ask for any ideas, go there. I like the filing cabinet thing. I've never succeeded in doing it. I struggle with that. But if it works for you, you could add a shredder. Oh, a shredder! <laughs> Stuff that you, you like, I don't even want to think about this anymore. Yeah. It's over. It's my ex-boyfriend. Shred it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the shredder. 
So yeah, that's an idea. It's never worked for me, but you know, we could try it. Could try it. If you're working with a filing cabinet, you got a file that's finished and over, and you want to end it. Yeah. Yeah. We, um, and I do. Um, I really try to box myself, and I do yoga nidra. That's basically reaction, relaxing, relaxing yoga. You can get a free one on Insight Timer. Me and the kids do that most nights, which is pretty good as well. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, hey, do I have to come share? Group? You have to yell. Yeah, sure. Go, Leo. You have to yell, yell, yell. This idea is not coming from me. It's coming from this group, Yogi group. It's like about mindfulness and what you're focusing at the time. It's like that old gramophone and which disc you're playing or what line on. They're there, but you choose which one to play. So if there is a one which is sad or you're not happy, okay, deal with it. It's there, but you don't need to keep playing it back on your head and yeah. be focused on what are you playing and what are you listening to. So that's more expensive. That's good, Leo. I've just been reading this book lately. It's a complicated thought, so I'm going to share it, but I might not share it in the best way. So it says that our experience is inside out. And by that, it means it comes from our inside, that our thoughts create our experience. So I might now be thinking, all right, so let me give an example. Um, I might be thinking that this, this has just been a total friggin' failure. And oh my God, why do we do this, right? Because I can't see the chat, so I'm hoping there's some semi-positive chat in there and some semi-positive email. But my, so my thought creates my experience of, well, oh my God, what a waste of time, shouldn't have done this, you know, everyone hated it. Or I could think, oh, actually, I think it's been good. You know, people have enjoyed it. And you see, it's the same experience, right? But how I think about it and how I feel about it has changed is by my thought. So the whole argument is that your experience of life and the world is inside out, it's generated by your thought, by your thoughts, and you can change your thoughts. I hope I've been clear on that because I'm only just reading this book, but I really like it. Okay, any other questions? And we'll move to where we've been. Go. No, anyone? Veronica? No? Uh, no, I was just going to say what I do is I, um, I listen a lot to audiobooks. So yeah. I don't hear my head going crazy. So if I can't go to sleep or whatever, I just uh, choose a book and I fall asleep in two seconds. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, so the last little five or 10 minutes, just so I have a formulated game plan. We have whipped through a trillion things, okay? And for it to be impactful though, we actually have to pick something and then implement it, okay? This is the, dif you know, the difference between yeah, I think I started with that saying, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So the last activity is to think about fixed focused growth. Uh, I can't remember who gave me this. It might have been Glenda, was it you Glenda? Someone gave me this, I can't remember, and I really like it. Uh, so you need to think about what do I want to fix? What do I want to focus on? And what do I want to grow in the next six months? So we're in the middle of June now, we're in June, start of July next, next, next week. So let's figure out what I want to fix and you figure out some priorities and write them down. So you should have uh, your workbook if you want to write in there or you can scribble a bit of paper. So for most of us, I would really like you to fix your beautiful bio, okay, online, make sure that looks, you know, sexy and good and strong. Put your research purpose in there and we're heading into the HBR student scholarship round, which is usually the month of September. Under your H there's a place in supervision, we at the students that you supervise, it's actually blank text at the top. You can type in there the type of students you're looking for. Like, I really would like to supervise students who are doing, who are interested in studying the experience of daylighting and design in hospitals and homes, or I'm really looking for students. I'm interested in supervising students in this space. So you can fix your QT bio um, and change it and get ready for the scholarship round. Focus, again, pick your one thing that you want to focus on for 2020. Uh, and it might be a Q1 publication, or it might be an industry network, or it might be, you know what, I want to find a, I want to find a friend, like I want to, you know, I'm, everyone wants to find a friend, but I mean find a research friend. <laughs> and so by that, I mean, maybe you're imaginary one, if you're a Manuela, and you need to pick a story with an imaginary <laughs> so project partner. I love it. That's the same with your toilet seat. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I really like really low bar for like a high bar for sharing. I'm really sorry, guys. Uh, but Leo was talking, he wants to find a friend to do Shut Up and Write with because none of the current sessions suit him. So someone drop him an email if they want to do a Shut Up and Write session with him outside the current sessions. So that's a thing you can focus on and grow. How do you want to develop? That's what I like about being an academic. Lifelong learning, like how cool is that? I'm so cheesy, but I believe it. Do it. Um, so you might want to grow on your social media.
Wikipedia, you've got a Twitter account. I've made some, I've, um, social media is really good. Like I've made some great connections through Twitter. Um, you might want to grow your writing skills. And there's just one kind of uh, activity that you want to grow or develop. Uh, keeping in mind that we are going to run a series, uh, Cam Canaro is kind of our writing coach for the lab. It's going to run a, I need to figure out exactly what it will look like, but some kind of workshop, a series of workshops in semester two about how to write a journal article and get that out there. So I'm going to stop talking so we can take a minute to write Fix, Focus, Grow. And then it'll be great if someone wants to share that too, uh, verbally with the group. While you're doing your Fix, Focus, Grow, just the, um, we've done that, so I've done that for myself and also for the lab. Uh, so We've sort of worked really hard on, on Design Lab brand and the websites. Marcus Ask and then the website read and Shelley uh, and Irina have been doing that. And also the physical space here. So you can kind of see it maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Um, we kind of want to do like a demonstrator maker exhibition space here. It's an interesting space because we're on the ground floor upstairs is Mandy, the Dean and the Dean's team. I was aware of it. Sorry, I just wanted to fix the website and the physical space. We're going to focus in November about growing everyone's brand. So just keep on profiling everybody. And then a big focus in sort of November, December uh, is on growing, is about engaging with industry partners and contributions. Okay, so that is to the end. Okay, so just a reminder that if you think about your fixed focus growing, what you want to do, we've covered lots of grounds. I'm going to recap it verbally and then take any questions and have a conversation. So we walk through your identity, who you are as a researcher, and what your mission statement and your brand is. It's really important that you figure that out because if you're not clear about what you have to offer, then I don't get to spruik you for somebody else and, and you close don't get to spruik you either. You need to have a nice solid brand so you can say, oh, that's right, Leo, he's all about making stuff. Yeah, he does this project. It's, if you have a nice, clear, solid identity and you, and you start sharing it with the universe, things happen. You know, and people start to know and they can connect you. It's really important and it can change, okay? So it's not locked in stone. It's just about, at least now, this is who I want to be and what I want to focus on, really important. Second thing we talked about was your one thing, okay? What's the one thing you want to achieve by the end of 2020? So that you'll be able to look back on this year and say, yeah, it was a pandemic, but I kept ass. I like, you know, I, it was a pandemic but, pandemic, but I still managed to do whatever this one thing is you want to do, really important, okay? So that we can feel happy about ourselves. You know, we can wrestle back some control. Yeah, we've got a heavy teaching load. It's bloody hard. I'm atrocious at this online teaching, um, online this. I actually, I'm it's nice having people here to see, right? But we can fix um, the one thing we want with our research and make that happen. The third thing we talked about was creating time for our research. Now, whether you do that through um, reading that Make Time book and focusing on your highlights, whether you download uh, the urgency signs from from that resource or whether you do something else, whether you use the burner, whether you use a Canton board, whether you get a bullet journal, you just need to figure out whether you create an imaginary friend online and you block some time out. It doesn't really matter what it is as long as you do something because remember if nothing changes, nothing changes. You need to develop your resilience, okay? So let's all break up with that ex-boyfriend of negativity, okay? Let's take my six-year-old Samantha's slogan, which I you know, she's going to hate me. She is hating me for sharing it. I've already told off about it. So let's not tell her. You see her. You know, we're talking about ex-boyfriends. Um, but let's develop our resilience and break up with our bad habits. Okay. We're the only one, you know, our only one who cares about ourselves is, is ourselves really at the end of the day. So we need to put ourselves first. And I was like, I think I quickly saw in the chat, there was an example of somebody who thought they were indispensable, but then they died and they weren't. And that is the truth. None of us are indispensable to so take your lead. Okay. And I try very hard every three months to take a long weekend, like every quarter, to take a couple of days off. So just try and do that and have some mini breaks. And then figure out your game plan. Come up with the fixed focus grow strategy and implement it. And that is it. I'm hoping that has been fun, uh, as fun as these things can be. Um, so yeah, we can all race off and go to the toilet, which I want to do very, very soon. You're welcome, Ruge. I can see the chat. Um, and let me know if you want to do this again, okay? So I actually love this stuff. Like I love figuring out how we can be more productive, reading a book, trying it, you know, tweaking it. So if anyone's interested, we can do this again. You're welcome. Um, and we can also focus on, I've been reading some great books about working with difficult people. And I'm sure while none of us in this group are difficult, we're all perfect. 
um, and really, yeah, I know, uh, we do have to work with a lot of academics who sometimes are um, not perfect uh, and a little bit difficult. So uh, we can do a session about that if we want. So let me know if anyone wants that, or if you want to run your own session, if anyone wants to run any kind of session on something, you know, it's all about just bringing people together and having chit chat. I'm stopping talking. Any comments, feedback, anyone want to say anything? And if people want to set up a book group, that would be great. I'd love to set a book group up, actually. Um, I'm actually, okay, I'm going to set a book group up. Do you want it to be like sort of self-help, productivity kind of stuff? Does that sound fun? Yeah, why not? I won't read it otherwise. I do, otherwise, I'm very slow at reading it. Oh, yeah, I love I love all that. So, um, okay, I'll set that up. I'll do an invite um, in one of the, no, no, after I'm back from holiday, it's going to take, I'm going to take some real leave. And I'm going to put it out of office email and do my best not to check them. And not checking emails is how do we manage when we come back? Because then it's, it's almost as if you didn't take any leave because you have all that accumulated stress from it. <laughs> okay, so Manuel just made the point that oh my god, when she comes back and you haven't checked your email, there's so many to deal with and what will happen. Does it really matter if someone really wants you? They'll email you four times. You know I mean? Like I wonder how if it's really important to pick the phone up. So I wonder if we could just drop the. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I had a chat once with. Um, it used to be a professional staff at the School of Design and he left, I don't know where he is now, PT, he's still at PT. But he used to put his message, his out of the office message was like, I'm out of the office, I'm on holidays. If you want to talk to me when I'm, I'll be back on this particular day. If you want anything from me, email me again. Yeah, read it. Because I will delete all of the messages that, that uh, were sent to me over the period of the holidays. Which for me made complete sense. And I said, wow, can you do this? And he said, well, <laughs> yes. But um, I, feel, I feel a bit, you know, I don't feel quite comfortable with that idea, even though I think it's maybe the correct thing to do. Because otherwise, it's as if you didn't have a holiday, if you have that level of stress of going back to. I quite like that. I, I, I've received that email, that I've emailed twice, and, you know, which says, I, you know, I'll delete them. But I wonder if we could just put a version of, I'm actually on leave. If this is really important, please contact me afterwards. I can't guarantee I'll be able to actually really catch, catch up. Yeah, catch up. Like, so a softer version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if we should do a whole separate, we hope to do a separate conversation about email management um, and things like that. If those, if those kind of things, so email management, meeting management, things, there's actually some great books, some par parody books about, um, parody, is that the word? No, Fable. So Fable is about management and, and leadership. <laughs> That's super cool. I know someone said they want leadership books too, so we can do that. So happy we could do this once a month or once a, a quarter or something where we talk about these kind of lifestyle things that are that we, you know, emails, leadership, meetings, the courage to have controversial, difficult conversations, when to let shit go. We can we can totally do that and take turns leading if there's interest. Just let us know, okay? Does anyone else want to pipe in? I'm going to finish up. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.